Welcome to the second episode of the Archangelo podcast. My name is Julian Forbes. I'm the general manager of Archangelo and I'm joined for this episode by the countertenor Yestin Davies. This October, we'll be heading into the recording studio with Yestin to complete our survey of the alto cantatas of J.S. Bach, a fine prospect in any year, but all the finer in this one. Yestin, I hope it's not too tactless to start by, well, first by welcoming you to the podcast and then by inviting you to tell us just how many concerts you haven't done this year and uh, where you should have been by now and haven't. Well, I can tell you what I've actually done because that's an easier number, which is I've done one Wigmore Hall and I've done two for the York Early Music Festival, two separate ones. And, oh, three. And then I did a, uh, so that's two, three. <laughs> And then I did one in Hatfield House the other day. I think I finished work, proper work, on March the 7th in New York, and I flew home on the 8th. And my diary was basically spend a week at home, then fly to Chicago for three concerts at the Chicago Symphony Orchestra of Handel, then go directly to Hamburg for three John Passions, um, then come back and do a nine, eight or nine concert tour of Handel's Rod Linder with English concert, then record it. Then this and then that I was supposed to go to Moscow for a concert. I mean, I've kind of forgotten because what my agent did was just delete everything from the diary. So I looked at my diary and like people say, <clears throat> you go on Twitter and somebody would say, oh, I'm really melancholic tonight because I was meant to be seeing you at the bar again. I was like, I don't know what I was meant to be doing. I've forgotten. And it's kind of easier that way because you just don't feel too bad about it. But the great thing is, it's promoted this kind of energy within everybody to think on their feet. And so actually things are sort of coming back. So when I bump, bump into people in the street and they say, oh, how's, how's the arts business? You know, any more news? And I said, well, I just assume everything up until December at the moment isn't happening as it was meant to. Yeah. And everything else is completely new. And what seems to be happening is lots of recordings. So because recordings are much easier to do because there's no audience involved. And, um, you know, it's a kind of bubble of musicians, which is a horrible phrase, but it's, it's the way we have to call, <laughs> let's call it. So I've done um, two discs just now, one of... Uh, Dishona Muller in with Joseph Middleton which is on a sort of subsidiary label of Signum Records uh, which is run by St John's College Cambridge where I was um, as an undergraduate and uh, then a disc with fretwork with Signum of some lovely Baroque German stuff um, and then of course I've got you know the disc with Arcangelo coming up in October which was always it was the only one that was actually ever planned and then the rest are you know we're recording Handel's Rod Linda with English concert which has been postponed but they got the fundraising for it so we can go ahead. It must have been the longest vocal break that you've had. Oh amazing it was a bit like going back to the beginning of one's career where you don't know what it feels like to be really busy but you think you're busy because you might have one gig a week or something and then <laughs> and then you start then it's done whereas now it's like well it's up till now it's been one week off and then three weeks doing stuff around different places, which could be all over the world or two months somewhere where you're not doing as much singing, but you're doing an opera. So you're rehearsing all the time. It's just constantly you're thinking in singer mode and actually not to think in singer mode is the, because I don't want to be flippant about it, but, you know, say, oh, it's been really great not to do any work because that, you know, I know a lot of people who depend on lots of work rather than the odd opera here and there. Um, it's more that not having to think about singing as a singer in particular, is a really great thing because we are our instrument. So if you wake up every day and you don't have to think, oh, I had one drink too many last night, I'm going to have to take today off, or oh God, I've got a gig tonight, or I won't drink. It just makes your life so much happier because your boundaries change completely. In that sense, it was, it was a vocal break, which probably should help. I mean, people say if you, if you don't run for a long time, it's quite hard to suddenly start running. But then I suppose the same, as long as you're you're aware that you've had a break and you're not going to suddenly be able to sing again. I took a, maybe a week and a half of just singing every day to get back into some sort of stamina level that was, ca was capable of singing an hour at the Wigmore live stream. Yeah, now that Wigmore live concert, I wanted to ask you about that. I watched it and it was strange to me as an audience member to see a concert being given to an empty Wigmore Hall, but it must have been quite odd for you what was it like to perform to an empty hall? How do you find your performance and your energy in those circumstances? My immediate reaction afterwards is actually it felt like an exam because there was no dissipation of the tension at all. Uh, so you didn't get any applause, which meant that there was no kind of, the sound didn't change in the building. So it was like silence when you finished, which is kind of lovely, but that's okay. When you're rehearsing, you kind of make a deal with the silence. You can talk after a piece and go, oh, should we do that again? And, but in a gig, you can't stop and say, oh, that was all right. Yeah, well, let's move on. You just have to carry on. 
But without an audience, there's no one coughing, shuffling, turning pages, clapping, which we kind of took for granted. And it's like, actually, I would have, could have done with someone's phone going off or something. And, in, and then we had Martin Hadley doing the radio presenting on one side of the hall. It's a small kind of little wooden school desk with a lamp and some notes and a pen. And then on the other side, John Gahooly, looking very much at home and looking a little bit like, that was a bit like an audition. It's like, well, welcome to my hall. And I just had the occasional kind of things of thinking, who am I singing to? It's really odd. But it was kind of really enjoyable because it, it, usually there's a real tension when you're doing broadcasts in front of an audience because you don't know literally if you're singing for the people right in front of you who can see or people at home. And so what you do is you play a game of tennis in your head, which is like you stop thinking about one of them. And so there might be a particularly difficult song and you think, I don't want to screw this one up. I don't want to be judged on this one forever. So I'll sing this for the radio and get it completely right. And the people in the hall may may notice and be disappointed but they'll forget instantly because of the ethereal nature of live music or vice versa you think i really enjoy this song and this is going to kind of break the tension in the audience and i'll i'll do it for them and i don't really care what people think of the radio mm -hmm. and um we couldn't do that because there was no one in the hall so you were constantly singing for the listeners or, or the viewers now sticking with the weirdness of lockdown for a little according to your twitter profile you had some pretty imaginative coping adventures during lockdown they included discovering a Roman marching camp, doing Alan Bennett impressions, and getting advice on Source from Nigella Lawson. Uh, what more, if anything, can you tell us about any of those adventures? The, the Roman marching camp, to put that in context, yeah, in 2018 we had a very, very dry summer. Google Maps tends to update its photographic maps every couple of years. And so at the moment it seems to be that if you look, scan around Britain and put on Google Image, most of the fields show up all the crop marks. Some people find this interesting. I did archaeology at university. I do find it interesting. But you, if you go up into space and you look down and there's been no water on the ground and it's very dry, certain bits of land will be drier than others because there is actually formations of past buildings and stuff underneath. So they'll come up a bit more yellow. I tweeted about this because there was a place just outside York called Acaster Malbis and anything with the word castor in is a marching camp. And so they are known to have these outside York on the way to York but they've never found one at a Castamalbus. Anyway, this across the river, and I saw this, what looked exactly like, and I tweeted to somebody, but the guy didn't seem hugely interested. He was like, you know, we have to sift through the entire photographic record of maps of 2018 at the moment, because it was such a good summer for looking for this stuff. So it, it kept me amused. And then, yeah, Alan Bennett. Yeah, I enjoyed doing Alan Bennett, because at the beginning of lockdown, I thought, oh, this is not going to go on for long. I'll do an Alan Bennett impression each day. Apologies for interrupting you, but I have to ask, why Alan? Be because I can do it quite well, I think. What's better than doing Alan Bennett being Alan Bennett is Alan Bennett reading things that he shouldn't be reading. So, for example, I couldn't find it, but I once, uh, at a party, somebody had one of those industry tool catalogues for builders with all these kind of, they have very funny names for kind of screws and stuff, which are lots of innuendo. But Alan Bennett reading these is, it seemed to be comedy gold at the time. Have you thought about ringing up the local archaeology board with your Alan Bennett impression to lend credence to your <laughs> Roman marching camp theory. Uh, yeah, they could just put everything together and then sort of, uh, and bring in Nigella Lawson as well and the bechamel sauce. That was, uh, Nigella does reply to messages. She replied to my, I was quite surprised actually, because I made a bechamel sauce. Was it bechamel or was it, yeah, it was something. Oh, that was it, it was for um, souffle. And I thought, she's a kind of souffle girl. And she replied quite, she said, I'm sorry, I'm not a souffle specialist. <laughs> but it was nice to get a tweet back from her anyway. Now, I must apologise because obviously I invited you onto the podcast to talk about our forthcoming recording plans, uh, instead of which I've diverted you off down the garden path and into the Roman trench, as it were. So bring us, bring us back on topic. Uh, we're, we're going back into the recording studio to record some more Bach together. Tell us more, please. Yes, this is the follow-up to the previous Bach Cantatus disc that I did with um, Arcangelo, which featured two cantatas, uh, Vida Steer and Fergunuk Taru, and Ich habe genug, I forgot, which is a technically not an alto cantata. Mm. I'm better sort of completing the, the cycle with Gott soll allein and Geist und Seele, which are very different pieces, actually, from the other two. The other two are much more... Well, they're easier to do on a small scale because they essentially you can do them with single strings and one oboe. Uh, whereas these two are bigger, they have organ concertos and symphonias in them. They're slightly different wind instruments. And in some senses, they're more sort of operatic or dramatic and characterful. Um, so it's, uh, it's a bigger project. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it because it then, then I've sort of done the outer things for Bach. 
which, mm. which I think is for altos in particular, or counter tenors, it's one of the few things we have because we sort of know that Bart kind of wrote this for an alto voice rather than Handel, who read a lot of stuff for Castorati. So it's our kind of way of, you know, this is our Goldberg variations or our Schubert Winterizer. What are the big challenges for you in these two cantatas particularly? Both these big cantatas, they're, they're full of really tricky moments. Um, you know, the, there's an aria in, um, I think it's in Geist und Seele, in BWV 35, the, la- the final aria in that. It starts with this beautiful tune. Dum, da, 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 and it's great, and you think, oh, I've got it. And then suddenly there's this triplet semi go which is basically an organ right hand, but for the singer. And he doesn't give you any time to breathe or change. So you have to sort of sing Bach in a way that was best described by Janet Baker when she said, don't try and be musical. Bach's already written it for you. It will sound phrased and that kind of stuff. It's, if you're a good singer and you sing it, dare I say, accurately, it will come across well. And that's always the thing with Bach is you can either perform it technically very accurately and it's still really, really kind of pleasing because there's something magical in the, in the dialogue of all the mathematical science in his music. Then there's this other way of performing Bach which is to be very expressive like you can with Handel where Handel, when it's not expressive, can be very wooden. Mm-hmm. Um, but with Bach, you can overplay that and it becomes very, very difficult to sing. And sometimes you just have to be very subservient to what he's written and just do it. And I think that that aria is... It's one of those things where if you were alive at the time, you would have just sort of looked at him and said, this guy's crazy and I hate his music. Um, but actually, it's glorious to listen to. Um, so that's, that for me is kind of the really challenging thing about these two cantatas. They, they're very vocally demanding. And I can't believe that teenage boys sang this. They must have sounded rubbish. <laughs> it's, so t- it's like if I'd sang it when I was 17, it'd be laughable. And I don't think I'm going to sing it now anyway. So there's, there's, do buy the disc. Um, You've reminded me of your other musical career that I guess started when you were a teenager. You were in a band? Uh, so my band was called Cage because in the time of Britpop, as you know, everyone had like monosyllabic nouns as their thing. It was like pulp, blur, oasis, uh, sleeper. It was like menswear. What do we call ourselves? And my friends would sit around at home going, um, ashtray. No, no, there's ash. Can't call ourselves ashtray. Table. No, it's, it's a bit wooden. And it was like Cage. I was like, oh yeah, it's cool. And it slightly had... S&M kind of qualities to it, <laughs> connotations. Yeah, we were kind of, I suppose we took our, so I wrote the songs and then we kind of played around with them in our group. And the other three, by the way, were all specialist musicians at Wales School. So it's one of the specialist music schools. Um, right. So there was a, a trumpet player called Sam Wedgwood who learned to play kit. So he was playing the drums. A trombone player called Andrew Dutch who went to Guildhall. And on guitar was a very naturally talented guitarist called Gareth Evans who lives in Cardiff. He was actually a horn player, but he'd always played the guitar and he was very fluent. He was particularly good at playing noodling guitar solos, which never quite fitted the sort of Britpop thing. So in the middle, in the middle of a kind of jangly song about whatever, there'd be like an Eddie Van Halen a riff solo thing in <laughs> two minutes. And it was always, it was all a bit spinal tap. But we did, we did send off our tapes uh, in answer to an advert for young male bands between 16 and 21, Do You Want to Be Famous thing that was advertised in a magazine which is now defunct called Select. And my mum rang me up once, I was at a friend's house, and she said, and she was deputy head of our school, so she had a finger on the pulse in terms of where I was heading academically. So she rang up and said, right, she's from Lancashire, and she said, um, you've ha- we've had a phone call from Sony Records, what's going on? <laughs> I was like, oh, wow, I sent them a thing about a month ago. That's amazing. She goes, I want to talk to you. So we, anyway, we had a chat and um, yeah, they, they'd heard our tape and they just invited us for interview. And I suppose it was a bit like what would now be on television as Pop Idol or something. It was, yeah. it was just kind of battle of a thousand bands. So you went along to Great Marlborough Street to where Sony was based and met a couple of A&R people who listened to us. And then they put us up in front of Rob Stringer, who ran Epic Records. And he, he got, they whittled us down to like four bands. And then he liked us and some band from Wolverhampton, apparently. And then they put you in this thing called development where you focus in on your songs and blah, blah, blah. And they kind of, I think they were going to turn us into a kind of McFly or busted sort of oh, yeah. clever boy band, you know, pretending to be guitarists, but actually we're going to really manufacture the hell out of you. And they, you know, we'll get you singing lessons. We'll get some help with the songs and all this kind of stuff. And it was a real eye opener about stuff. And they said, this song here, which you've written, with the right financial backing, I can get that to number one. I was like, 
oh yeah, financial backing. And it was just that it was all money. And he said to us, the last sort of contact we had with this guy, he, he was going to be our manager. He said, I'm going to have two bands in the top 10 next year. There's going to be you and this other band I've just signed who are like a five piece white soul kind of disco. They're really like ABBA. And it turned out to be Steps. We could have been the, the kind of uh, stable mates of Steps. <laughs> I think I thought I was Damon Albert actually. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I didn't do the Liam Gallagher thing of standing with your hands behind the back and crooning your neck in the air. I don't know. It's, you've all got to have your idols. And then, and then a couple of years later, someone gave me an Andrew Scholl disc. I was like, oh, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a German counter <laughs> Yes. Oh, just going back to the disc, actually. Yes, it's fr- from, from Step to, from Steps to Schutz. Bunt, Zek, Sieben, Acht. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Heinrich, Heinrich Schutz and Dietrich Buxtehude are the totally happening composers that we're filling out this second bark disc with. Tell us about the two pieces and why you've chosen them. Um, they're both utterly beautiful pieces. My, in the words of the da- dance choreographer Mark Morris, who when he's asked, why did you select this music? You know, tell me about this music you wanted to set the dance to. He's, he just says, is it enough to say I like it? And it's kind of that. I really want to do these, these pieces and where best to do it on a disc with Bach. The Books to Huda is particularly poignant. It was, it's Klaglied, which is uh, it's basically a mourning song. And I think he wrote it and performed it uh, at his, his own father's funeral. And it's set over seven stanzas. And it's it just, obviously, listening to something that long, in a way, seven times it's very kind of um soporific in the best way but it's incredibly melancholy it's utterly beautiful Schutzerbandich. it starts off it's kind of like um like many of those pieces of the time they all start with these very slow symphonias for the vials and they come out of nothing it's like a sort of like the beginning of the universe it's just it's almost like an accordion opening up and it just builds and builds and then you have this release and you get this just beautiful lilting and setting the word Abambi on and off and and it's a yeah it's a piece I was meant to perform this summer at the Wigmore Hall and in a concert with the uh, again with the, the Dunedin concert on Jumbat so I can't wait to do this with Arcangelo it's going to be really fun it, I mean it's probably worth saying people probably listening to this think why are you recording stuff you haven't performed before there's a there's a funny thing about recording is that often it's the best way to get to know a piece because you, you end up really listening, which you don't tend to do when you're rec- uh, rehearsing for a concert. Only one person really is listening because as a singer, you, you think you're hearing everything. But actually, when you go back and listen in the sound booth with the producer, you hear really what's not together and what's not right. Mm. And some people argue it's better to record something and then tour it because you've got a product to sell, which I do think is actually true. But then other people like to say, let's do a couple of running concerts so that we're not rehearsing when we record. But I think if with the right sort of balance, re- a recording session, if there's enough time, can be an enjoyable sort of exploration of stuff and you can get a really interesting thing because ultimately recording is very false. It's a combination of lots of different versions of the same piece done over an hour or so, strung together in a patchwork. And I, I think for me personally, I'm happiest with the recordings I did live at the Wigmore Hall because I know there was one take. So I don't think, oh, I'm sure there was a better one than that. I just think that's it. And sometimes you can get too fussy in a recording and, and waste so much time trying to aim for perfection. And I, I don't, I think there's a lot of guff about perfection. I don't really think it's something to aim for. Yeah, you've made a lot of recordings already in your career. What have you learned about recording in that time? Firstly, you learn a lot about preparation because I've done some of this with literally no preparation and thought, I kind of know what I'm doing. And actually it makes life really hard because the other thing that you learn is that patience is a massive virtue in a recording because in a big session with lots of people, but, but it's your solo disc. So for example, recording Arcangelo without Arcangelo and there's an orchestra there, but ultimately, you know, the disc is you singing arias accompanied by an orchestra. Yes, it's a, accompanied by, but it's, everyone's really chipping in. And it's quite difficult to know who's in charge because, um, so often you have to sort of stand there and say nothing just to speed things up because if everyone talks, it slows down a bit and you're always conscious of how much voice you have and you want to please all these people and you want to get things right. So those big sessions can be really tiring. Uh, so I've kind of learned that sometimes the pressure of time, it's not worth worrying about because I often I'd look at my watch and think, we've only got an hour and a quarter, we've got seven minutes of music. And actually it can go quite slowly and yet you can get quite a lot done, if that makes sense. 
it doesn't an hour you can do a lot in an hour when you're recording a small amount of music weirdly um and actually pacing yourself in that way reaps benefits i try as well i know we haven't done it for this one but i try if i can to persuade especially when i've done the disc i just done with um joe middleton of schubert's die schöne Müller, which had 20 songs and you know it's kind of new territory for me in a, in a way we did it in four days rather than three because okay. there's this this kind of strange tradition where all recordings are done in three days and it doesn't really bear any relevance to the rest of the recording world of any other type of music where a pop band can go to Rockfield Studios and spend 12 months there. Of course, the budgets have a lot to do with it. And most recordings with a big orchestra so are done in a venue which can hold them. So they're often done in a church where you're renting the space yeah. and you have a certain time frame. You have 10.30 till 5.30 or whatever. So there's this kind of thing, you have three hours to make the exact magic we need, which is, for me, in general, the weirdest way about going putting something down which you then you release forever and what's been nice about doing two people discs is that if you pick the right venue to record it so i've recorded in this place called pot and hall in suffolk which has a wonderful barn which you can record and it's good for a small ensemble or duo is that you can you have all day you don't have any constraints on the time so you can go oh you know what i'm a bit tired let's have an hour off and also it means you can you can just about as long as they're willing the record companies are willing to stump up the paying for an extra day in renting the building then you can sort of pace yourself so for the Schubert we just did you know, it was 20 songs we had four days so we did five songs a day which is you know two in the morning three in the afternoon it's pretty good it means you're always fresh you don't sound knackered and so that's one thing I've learned which was to in some cases be a bit more affirmative about that because I wrote to the, the, the owner of the record label we're recording for and I said he said okay I can book it for these three days and I said could you do it for four and he said well usually it's three and I said I know but that's there's no there's no science to that. I just, I want to do it for because it makes so much difference. And he said, yeah, fine. And it was that easy. So I kind of, sometimes it, it what, what you learn from doing recording is, is how to be, you know, it is actually your opportunity to, to say something. Whereas I think in a concert or an opera stuff, people are all working towards one thing. So rehearsals and stuff like that, they have a time limit. There is a sort of energy which needs to be kept going and you can't just stop and keep going over things. Whereas a recording, I think it's okay to be like in a science lab and say, actually, I really want to do that again. Or I, can we not do that again? Because, because for the umpteenth time, the violin player suddenly said, I have never played that note right. It's like, well, you've had 20 goes and my vocal bit is now perfect. It's, um, that's just an example, you know, so made that up. Yeah, it teaches you how to be affirmative. Yeah, affirmatives. Let's stick with them. What's your favourite classical vocal record of all time? I think, actually, to be honest, one of the, the disc I listened to when I was little, when I was a chorister, I used to, I used to avidly listen to St John's recording of the, the Poulenc Mass in G, uh, which was done in 1970-something. You can hear the buses on Bridge Street going past and stuff like that. But the... That recording in general, I just loved it. And it was, it made me really, we hadn't done the piece. It made me so, so excited to perform. I was like, I remember thinking when Chris Robinson, he came, took over from George Guest and he said, we're going to do this Pure Master G. I was like, oh my God. Like I was meeting the Beatles and some kind of screaming teenager. But that and there was a recording of the Ceremony of Carols as well, which they'd done in the 60s. As a boy who sang, I was like, I really want to do this because for me at that age, and I don't know whether it's the same for other boys, it felt like, oh God, I hope, I hope a girl comes to watch because it's really cool, which is kind yeah. of unheard of. But I yeah. genuinely thought it was really cool to show off and sing Britain Ceremony Carols and Pilar S&G. So they, they are still my favourite recordings. They still press that button. They still touch the parts that other recorded today. We had a, we had a phrase at Trinity, which, which came from if we were ever playing football, which of course we didn't do very well or very often. Um, and if an attractive person yeah, started be a man. Past, somebody would say, play like Brazil. Um, <laughs> everyone would start doing step overs and ridiculous pseudo skill moves and the the phrase transferred into the chapel and if an attractive person should turn up in the congregation somebody like sing like brazil could i miss the brevis i'm gonna sing like brazil that's really good i like that i thought when you said play like brazil it's gonna make make a few more passes but yeah okay fine <laughs> right right back on topic back on topic favorite classical non-vocal album I always listen to the Handel Concerti Grossi recorded by Il Giardino Armonico. Oh. Um, I think it's so, it's quite a slightly crazy interpretation, but it's, it's so wonderfully played in that sense. And I can, it's long enough that you can put it on in the background when you're cooking or you're doing a tax return or something like that. It just, 
it's so and, it, and I just hum along with it and it's so good mm -hmm. to find that it's not like a big symphony where you kind of switch off a bit with the exposition it's just like every moment of Handel Concerto Grosso is wonderful and if they play kind of obediently it's it can be a bit boring a bit you know but these guys yeah they bring every single note it's, it's just got a kind of a kind of backstory so that I, I I suppose that for me is my go-to one more favorite non-classical album I, I think is a sort of it's a it's a toss-up between Led Zeppelin 2 oh. or Marvin Gaye what's going on I think good albums are ones that you just put on you don't miss out tracks right. what's going on is amazing and then Led Zeppelin 2 is just the playing of Led Zeppelin I mean it could be any Led Zeppelin but their playing is the secret of their success. They're just geniuses what they do. And I met the bass player, John Paul Jones, and he's right, I think he's gone back into sort of more classical music. He's trying to write an opera in the moment. And so he was at, yeah, it wasn't recently, it was about <laughs> four years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, he was at Don Giovanni and I was there to see Alan Clayton. And uh, yeah, it was really interesting talking to him about the Zeppelin stuff. And I was saying how much their music reminded me in a way because it came out of that blues world where the bass line holds the whole thing together. And then on the top, you have Robert Plant extemporizing in this yelling falsetto. And then you have the guitarist who's kind of also free to play what he wants, but also has, there's a kind of Ritonello riff at certain points. It's, but it all feels like Baroque music to me. It goes back to a formula, but there's a sense of freedom within it. And actually all of it is dance based. So it's, it, it's, it's like dance music without it being fast in the modern sense of dance music, um, which is what I love about the Concerti Grosso by Handel as well, is that it kind of rocks. It's sort of, it's not sort of sympathetic and, and like some of Handel's really lush arias for soprano and, you know, Lascia Kipianga stuff, which sentimentality. The, for me, that's not the Concerti Grosso and it's also not Led Zeppelin. It's kind of on the edge saying, we've got one chance to write music and we're gonna, they just seem to get straight to the point. Sense of an ending. Wait, that's uh, that's Julian Barnes. I thought we'd got back to Alan Bennett, but we hadn't. No, that's, uh, that's no. Yeah. I want to do talking to Alan Bennett because one of the things you actually didn't ask me, but you you had suggested you might ask me was how about how, how do you come across an accent like an impression? Yeah, I it was. I you know, we can finish with this. I don't know, but I heard somebody else doing an impression of him, which the words they said were exactly the words you needed to get into it. So it was somebody who did an impression. He said. We're talking about Peter Cook and Dudley Moore, of course, who, you know, contemporaries of Anna Bennett. And he said, and Pete and Dud were there too. And I thought, that's the way in. You say that, and then you've got the whole thing. Whereas if he'd said something like, it's raining outside, it wouldn't, I don't know how to do it. And then one day I was a bit drunk and I just sort of spoiled it and I picked up his diary and read it a bit. And the person in the room said, that's really spooky. And then I suddenly could do it. But it didn't, it, can, I've heard other, I've heard not other impressionists, but I've heard real impressionists say, you just need a way in. And I, I think because I'm a singer and a musician, that also helps because we tend yeah. to have more acutely attuned ears to impersonation because singing a lot of the time is copying. You know, you learn to sing as, as a treble by copying the boys next to you. You don't really get taught how to sing and you imitate sound, you listen to recordings, you go, oh, I want to sound like that. And, you, and, it, and it's a sensation. So I think if I hear something that's distinct, I can copy it quite easily, which might be in the end how I learned to sing as an alto. Maybe I listened to enough recordings I liked and I sort of copied the sound and eventually had lessons and sort of realized how to hold that sound for longer. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Alan Bennett came out of just hearing somebody else say it. And I thought about it before, I was like, how do you do that? And then they just did it. I was like, oh. yeah. um, and there's a whole another long story attached to Alan Bennett, which involves me being in a shop and him hearing me on the phone and writing about me in my diary saying, in his diary saying, there was a man speaking too loudly on his phone. And I've written to him about that since about 10 years later, I said, that was me. And he wrote a really nice postcard back to me, which was Benetton to, the, to a T. Everything in the postcard was, was a quotable reference to something. He said, I remember the daunts incident, though it makes me feel an old git. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got that slipped into the Untold Stories diary oh, page. Brilliant. What were you saying on the phone? Can you remember? Yeah, I can, because it was 2004-ish. I lived near the academy where I was studying at the time, and I'd just got an agent, a chap called Andrew Hammond, and he was ringing me with news about work that he got me, and it was really early on my career, and it's always exciting. He said, I've got this thing, and they're going to pay you 3,000 euros, and it's a you know, couple of days, this and this. And I was like, oh, wow, 3,000 euros, oh, wow. <laughs> and Alan Bennett wrote in his diary, because it was an empty shop at the time. He was at the back, and I'd rung my agent, because Andrew had when he was at Clare Cambridge in the 80s, he'd studied English. 
And so I thought he'd be excited to know us with Alan Bennett. So I said, oh my God, Alan Bennett's in the shop and he's there with his bicycle clips on. And he looks, it's amazing. I'm, and he just said, well, while I've got you on the phone, this contract's come through and you'll be very pleased. I managed to negotiate this. And so I talked about this quite loudly because no one else in the shop and it's relatively early days of mobile phones as well. So maybe we haven't learned. It was before Dom Jolly had gone, I'm on the phone. Yeah. And so it was just to my utter surprise a couple of years later, I went into Dawn's to look at the new tome that he'd released called Untold Stories, which is, if you don't know, collections of diaries and plays and stuff. And I opened it without any word of a lie. It fell open on the page in which the diary mentioned was there. I kid you not. I like to think oh, it was kind of magic, but it was just coincidence. It's probably where the binding was. But it opened. It said August the something 2004, shopping in London, central London is nothing short of a chore, uh, no more prevalent today in Daunch Books, Maribone, where a man is speaking on his phone so loudly about Euros, it's quite embarrassing. <laughs> and I, I stood there in the shop and went, oh my God. I like, I'll have a copy, thank you. Um, but I love the fact that he said to me, it makes him feel like an old git that he was whinging about the mobile phone. I could have said, yeah, you didn't know what was coming. Well, I think that's just about it. Yestin, thank you very much for being with us on the Arcangelo podcast. And as we said at the outset, it's no exaggeration at all this year to say that we are really looking forward to recording with you in October. I'm looking forward to it too. And I'm glad I could join you in my busy, busy schedule today of sitting around having coffee. (laughs) 